Did you know medieval wives could be sold like cattle? Well, let's explore this and other ten shocking yet captivating aspects of medieval life that defy our modern understanding in this eye-opening journey. Number one, trial by ordeal, divine justice and medieval beliefs. Ever wonder how our ancestors settled disputes back in medieval Europe? Well, picture this. You're accused of a crime in the Middle Ages and your fate depends on, wait for it, surviving an ordeal. Yep, you heard me right. The Middle Ages weren't just about knights and castles. They were also the age of divine judgment. So, how did it work? Well, first, you'd be accused of something like theft or witchcraft. Then you'd have to choose your poison quite literally. There were two main options, ordeal by fire or ordeal by water. In ordeal by fire, you'd have to hold a red-hot iron bar or walk barefoot over burning coals. If your hand or feet healed cleanly after a few days, congrats, you were innocent. But if not, well, you probably weren't enjoying that medieval healthcare. Ordeal by water involved being tied up and tossed into a pond or river. If you sank, it meant you were innocent because, you know, water wouldn't accept a sinner. But if you floated, oh, the divine waters had rejected you, and you were in hot water, literally. This strange practice reflects the medieval belief that God would intervene and protect the innocent. Spoiler alert, trial by ordeal didn't survive the Enlightenment's age of reason, but boy, is it a wild ride through history. So, hold on to your hats, because we've got nine more medieval mysteries to unravel. Number two, tithing and frank pledge, regulating communities. Back in the day, there were no cell phones, no internet, and definitely no 911. How did medieval folks make sure their neighbours weren't up to no good? That's where tithing and frank pledge come into play. Tithing was like a neighbourhood watch on steroids. Instead of binge-watching crime shows, medieval villagers banded together in groups of ten, or tithings, and vowed to keep each other out of trouble. If one member did something wrong, the others had to bring them to justice. It was like a built-in accountability system. But wait, there's more. Enter Frank Pledge, a medieval version of the ultimate buddy system. Each tithing grouped up with nine other tithings to form a hundred, yes, that's what they called it, and they all had to vouch for each other's good behaviour. If one hundred member committed a crime, everyone else had to make sure they faced justice. It's like your entire friend group being held responsible for that one friend who can't resist swiping fries from someone else's plate. Now, you might be wondering, why did people do this? Well, in a time when law enforcement was more about community trust than uniformed officers, tithing and frank pledge were all about keeping the peace. These systems evolved over time and gradually faded as more formal legal systems emerged. Number three... Alchemy in everyday life. Practical applications of mystical science. When you think of alchemy, you might picture bearded sorcerers in dusty old towers trying to turn lead into gold. But here's the twist. Alchemy wasn't just about striking it rich. Nope, it had its practical side too. Back in medieval times, alchemists were the equivalent of today's doctors and pharmacists. Imagine you've got a nasty case of the flu and you're not feeling too hot. Well, you wouldn't be rushing to the pharmacy like we do nowadays. Nope, you'd be heading straight for an alchemist shop. These guys were the healers of the day, brewing up potions and remedies to cure your ailments. But wait, there's more. Alchemy wasn't just about fixing up your runny nose. It was also deeply intertwined with spirituality. Alchemists believed that their work wasn't just about mixing chemicals. It was a journey of inner transformation. They thought that by perfecting the art of transmutation, changing one substance into another, they could also perfect themselves. It's like a self-help book, but with way more bubbling cauldrons. Number four, courtly, love and troubadours, subverting social norms. Courtly love was the ultimate love story genre of the Middle Ages, and it was far from your typical happily ever after. So, what's the deal with courtly love, you ask? Well... It was like a secret code of romance, where knights went all goo-goo-eyed for married noblewomen while penning down their deepest feelings. Scandalous, right? But it gets juicier. 
These troubadours, basically medieval rock stars, were the ones singing these lovey-dovey songs. They weren't just serenading, though. They were shaking things up. See, courtly love wasn't just about breaking hearts. It was a full-blown rebellion against social norms. Imagine the medieval world as a rigid hierarchy with knights and nobles at the top. Courtly love turned it all topsy-turvy. It challenged the idea of arranged marriages and said, hey, let's follow our hearts, even if it's complicated. And the ladies? They weren't just damsels in distress. They were strong, independent women who could make a knight sweat just by batting their eyelashes. Courtly love gave them a voice and a role beyond just being decorative. Now, what's really fascinating is how these love stories spread like wildfire thanks to the troubadours. They were like the original social media influencers, taking these tales from castle to castle, sparking conversations about love, gender roles, and of course, scandalous affairs. Number five, medieval guilds and secret handshakes beyond trade unions. Imagine you're a skilled craftsman in the 12th century, making swords or crafting intricate tapestries. You're good at what you do, but you want more than just a paycheck. You want to belong to something bigger, something like a medieval version of a modern-day professional association. That's where the guilds come in. Guilds weren't just about making fancy door knockers and goblets. They were like the OG social networks of the Middle Ages, where craftsmen and artisans banded together. They weren't just about sharing trade secrets, though secret handshakes were a thing. They were about mentoring young apprentices, upholding quality standards, and even helping members in times of trouble. Think of it like this. Guilds were a bit like trade unions, but with a medieval twist. They were exclusive clubs for blacksmiths, bakers, and brewers, but they did more than just protect their members' interests. Guilds were like the guardians of their respective crafts, making sure shoddy work didn't tarnish their reputations. And here's the cool part. Guilds weren't just about hammers and anvils. They had a moral code too. They were like the medieval knights of craftsmanship, promoting values and ethics. Sure, they made excellent suits of armor, but they also aimed to be upstanding members of society. As time went on, these guilds evolved and their influence extended beyond the workshop. They played a pivotal role in shaping what we now call vocation. The idea that your job should be more than just a paycheck. It should be your calling. Number six, jesters and fools. Humor as social commentary. You know those funny folks in medieval castles who juggled and cracked jokes? Yeah, they were way more than just court clowns. They were jesters and they had a knack for stirring the pot, turning laughter into a form of social commentary. Ever wondered why the king kept a jester close by, even though their humour often poked fun at the crown? It's because jesters had a unique role. They were the voices of truth disguised as laughter. Think about it. In a time when speaking against the monarchy could get your head chopped off, jesters had a licence to roast. They used humour and satire like a secret weapon to critique the norms of the day and even those in power. Imagine a packed castle hall, nobles in their fancy robes and the jester in the centre pulling off pranks and making everyone burst into laughter. But hidden behind the laughter were clever insights, challenging society's rules and giving the masses a chance to see through the absurdity of their world. Number seven, the ducking stool. Justice, gender, and public spectacle. Ever wonder how they dished out justice in medieval Europe? Well, get ready for a wild ride through time as we dive headfirst into the murky waters of the ducking stool. Picture this. You're in a bustling medieval town square and the crowd is buzzing with excitement. Why? Because someone's about to get dunked in the local pond and trust me, it's not a hot summer day at the beach we're talking about. Meet the ducking stool, a medieval contraption that was part justice, part public humiliation and a whole lot of controversy. Back then, it was like the ultimate reality TV show, but with a twist, literally. So, what's the deal with this curious contraption? Well, it was used to punish people accused of crimes, mainly women accused of being gossips, scolds or witches. 
Imagine being strapped to a chair like a twisted version of a water park ride and then repeatedly dunked into the water. It wasn't just about getting wet, it was about public shame, humiliation and often a test of one's innocence or guilt. But here's the kicker. The ducking stool wasn't just about law and order. It was deeply intertwined with Christian theology, with some folks believing that the water's purity would somehow cleanse the accused. So it's like they combined religion, justice and a splash of spectacle all in one big dunking session. Number eight, wandering minstrels, storytellers and cultural bridges. These minstrels were the OG storytellers and cultural ambassadors traveling from village to castle, from tavern to town square, armed with nothing but their voices, instruments and a pocket full of tales. You might think they were just there to strum a lute and sing a catchy tune, but these folks were more than just entertainers. Imagine them as the medieval version of social media influencers, but instead of Instagram, they used their art to narrate communal stories, keeping the oral tradition alive. They weren't just there to make you tap your foot. They were history keepers, passing down legends, myths and historical events through their songs and stories. And it wasn't just about entertainment either. These minstrels were cultural bridges, connecting different regions and languages. They pick up stories and tunes from one place and carry them to another, enriching medieval society with a diverse tapestry of stories and music. But wait, there's more. They were also the news anchors of their time, broadcasting important happenings through their ballads, no 24-7 news channels or Twitter feeds back then, folks. If you wanted to know what was going on, you listened to a minstrel's song. Number 9. Feast of Fools. Social critique and renewal. You might be thinking, what kind of feast is this? Is it about eating until you burst? Not quite. It's more like a party with a purpose. A medieval Mardi Gras where the world got a little topsy-turvy. Picture this. It's the Middle Ages, and the Feast of Fools is in full swing. Priests become pranksters, and the church transforms into a house of laughter. But why, you ask? It's simple. The Feast of Fools was like a pressure valve for medieval society. Back then, life was pretty strict, with rules and hierarchies governing every aspect. But during this feast, those rules took a holiday. The lowest-ranking folks in town, the so-called fools, became the lords of the day. They'd mock the solemn rituals, wear mismatched clothes, and even sit in the bishop's seat. Imagine the audacity. This wasn't just about having a good time. It was about letting off steam. People got to question the norms and the powers that be. It was like medieval therapy, a way to blow off some steam without upsetting the apple cart too much. Number 10. Mystery plays, communal storytelling and interpretation. Mystery plays were like the original immersive theater, but with a divine twist. These plays weren't about some made up fantasy world. They were all about the Bible. Yep, you heard me right. They brought the Bible to life right in front of your eyes. Imagine watching Adam and Eve frolic in the Garden of Eden or Noah building that famous ark. But here's the twist. The actors weren't Hollywood stars. They were your neighbors, regular folks from your town. No fancy costumes or CGI effects, just simple props and their passion for storytelling. The best part? It wasn't a one-way street. The audience didn't just sit back and munch on popcorn. They actively participated. They shouted, cheered, and even threw in some heckling if the performance wasn't up to par. So you were not just an observer, you were part of the show, making it a true communal experience. But these plays were more than just entertainment. They were a way to teach, inspire, and bring people closer to their faith. You see, back then, not everyone could read the Bible, so the mystery plays were like the Cliff's Notes version, making the stories accessible to everyone. And that's it. If you enjoyed this video, then here is another banger for you. Click the video on the screen right now and take a look. And as always, thanks for watching.